our platform. Okay. Um, the platform uh, Disability Studies in Eastern Europe Reconfigurations um, is um, a research platform that is funded by the Jagiellonian University, but it is an international um, um, space for uh, researchers um, investigating uh, disability studies or disability um, in Eastern Europe and um, coming or living uh, in, uh, in Eastern Europe. And um, in a moment, I will share with you the links uh, to our website um, and to uh, the list of, uh, or the, of, re of the recordings of the previous lectures. Um, as you can imagine, as we re uh, uh, record them, they, they all end up on our uh, web page on, on YouTube. So you can access um, these, these films there. And uh, without further ado, I would like to uh, start uh, the very seminar, um, which is, as always, devoted, uh, divided into two parts. The first one is a lecture, and um, this time um, Katarzyna Kolarzowa will be sharing her uh, research with us. And after the uh, lecture and Q&A, there will be something like five, 10 minutes break, and then we'll come back in the very same Zoom room, Zoom room uh, for a workshop that will be um, led by Katarzyna and Alison Patsavas. Um, and um, um, yeah, so uh, so that's the plan for uh, for today. And I would like to briefly introduce um, Katarzyna just before her lecture. She is an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology at the Charles University in Prague. And she's also a researcher in the Institute of Sociology of the Czech Academy of Sciences. In her work, she um, intersects uh, disability, creep, queer, and uh, critical race theories, and she is concentrated um, on uh, post-socialism. And uh, she publishes um, a lot in this, uh, in this area. Um, in 2021, uh, she uh, co-edited um, edited volume, Reimaginations of Disability in State Socialism, uh, published by Chicago University Press. Uh, she also publishes um, in Feminist Review, Journal of Literary and Disability uh, cultural, cultural Disability Studies, uh, Soma Technique, Sociology of Health and Illness. And we are all waiting for her new book that is forthcoming uh, from Michigan University Press. And it will be Rehabilitative Post Socialism, that's the title. And the book already received, I mean, the manuscript already received Tobin Sievers Prize in 2019. Um, Katarzyna, the floor is yours. Magda, thank you so much for the lovely introduction. Uh, it was really sweet. Also, I want to say it's probably also end of this. Okay, so full disclosure, it's not only two of us, it's three of us. There is more than human uh, society. Part of our household has been just uh, lovely commenting on uh, the environment. I'm sorry for it. So don't get scared if there is some barking happening. Also, end of the semester, Friday afternoon, I really appreciate that you came and are in the space with us and that you are willing to give your time and energies and capacities to uh, engage with our work. So thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I will try to share my PowerPoint um, in the hopes that it will make uh, the talk more accessible. Uh, Ellie, help. Yeah. Uh, I'm I am using mm -hmm. Alice computer so uh, okay yeah so this is just uh, I also don't see you but okay so this is the cover of the book that Magda so uh, kindly mentioned on uh, imaginations of disability under state socialism so um, if you're and okay I will start where uh, Magda ended <laughs> you're all waiting for the book to be done and uh, I sort of take the unfinished state of the manuscript as, as a reference on uh, the pandemic. So mirroring the situation of many, the work on the final revisions of post-socialist rehabilitations has been derailed and delayed by the ongoing pandemic. Her work, the stress and exhaustion that it perhaps did not cause, but without doubt multiplied and intensified. 
And here I am leaning on work on of Jun Nugian Erne and Ted Stribhas that have fittingly coined a new appellation for the much discussed COVID-19, and they call it the multiplier, and propose to abandon the view of the pandemic as a singular tragic event. Instead, they argue that the pandemic is in fact, I quote, a series of crises superimposed with such a pressure as to leave one wondering where even to begin at all. To accentuate the multiplicity of the COVID-19 pandemic and challenge the impulse to see it as a public health crisis primarily, Ernie and Stripphaus push us to acknowledge the ways in which the pandemic is interconnected with myriad differing forms of structural violence that come out in the climate catastrophes, white supremacy, or attacks at the democratic processes by authority and regimes across the globe. Ernie and Stripphaus express it expressly I quote, reject the idea that these events have merely been a backdrop against which COVID unfolded, unquote. But they actually argue that these, these crises altogether have shaped the, uh, the form the pandemic has taken. So drawing on the notion of the COVID-19 as the multiplier, I closed this book. So this is the conclusion. I have not published it yet. It's really raw. So bear with me. So I closed the sort of thinking about post-socialism by discussing on how the pandemic draws out features of rehabilitative citizenship, the core concept of the book, and how its political and affective structures underwrote and determined the outcome of the COVID-19 pandemic and crisis in the Czech Republic. I want to, I, I will be talking about the Crip Horizons and their impossibility as the title promises, but I wanted to foreground our discussion, something that I don't have time to really delve into but are very specifically important for the ways that the pandemic happened. And this is the sort of binary day flexible, but still persistent of East and West and how Eastern Europe actually figured in the pandemic. So East, East and West remain flexible, always shifting in relational signifiers. However, the violence of a differential calculus of vulnerability to the virus, uh, SARS-CoV-2, attests to how their binary relation has been re reinforced during the pandemic and ma mapped onto a differential calculus of human values across the boundary of East and West. Alice uh, tells me I should slow down, so uh, I will try. Oh, there is also, what did I do? Comment in the chat. Uh, do I, let me check if... <laughs> Recordings. Okay. Once again, not novel, but intensified and accentuated through the health and economic crisis, labor became the category where the East and West distinction they're enacted. And also labor has become the axis where disability and disability have materialized in many occasions. So then under the conditions of the pandemic, the capacity and need to become a flexible and mobile laborer came forth not only as the primary locus of ethnicization and racialization in Europe, as El Tayeb has argued, but the laborer who had to move with the global economy were also turned into the prime embodiments of biosocial vulnerability. For instance, uh, three years ago in spring, the asparago season in Germany in 2020 coincided with the first lockdowns. As the majority of Germany was directed to shelter in place, the overfilled charity flights from Romania imported workers to harvest the so-called white gold because asparagus has to be harvested. Later in that season, every harvest in the Western Europe raised worries about who will harvest as others shelter or are unable to travel due to the pandemic restrictions, proving how much of the European food production depends on the available and cheap, that is highly undervalued labor of the East European and Southern workers. Similarly, West depends on the East and South in other fields of reproductive labor, most importantly, and that is relevant to disability, care and assistance work. As the pandemic provoked intensification of fortressing Europe and stricter reenactment of national borders and protection of Europe from outside, both migrant workers and the elderly and disabled people who rely on their labor with their health and life remained separated in pre precarious positions. So thus labor capacity defined the East and West economic inequalities here functioned as a pre-existing condition for the Eastern European workers and uh, people with disabilities in Europe at large. 
the reliance on cheap labor for an advantage in the global economy affected not only the migrant workers, but also the decision on preventive measures and potential closing down of the factories, uh, production sites within the national borders. Many Eastern European lives value thus very defined by calculations of their commodifiability as a cheap and flexible labor. I believe that paying attention to such persisting structural and economic inequalities across Europe and actually uh, larger than Europe and the ways in which they motivated differing regimes of immobility or policies of worker protection and or not afforded sheltering in homes puts under pressure the pandemic representation of many of the Eastern European countries. It helps to challenge the ideological constructions of the Eastern European region as a space of ambivalent exceptionality. While in the early months of the pandemic, international commentators inquired why Eastern Europe fared so much better than the rest of Europe and found answers with varying measure of troubling Orientalism. As the pandemic went on, the countries of Eastern Europe attracted ne negative attention for the infection spiraling out of control and very even called the infections hotspots. Uh, Czech Republic has been called by the German media, the Mutationsgebiet. The encounter with the new vital agency was thus instrumental in revealing the effective ideological and economic power still vested in the East and West binaries, as well as in the histories of socialism. So for instance, talking about socialism, for instance, while the puzzlement about the success of e, uh, Eastern Europe in the first waves of pandemic was often attributed to the learned docility and ingrained obedience to the state that supposedly led to higher compliance with the epidemiological restrictions, only few scholars have pointed out to the legacies of collective and solidaristic healthcare understand, and understanding of that collectivity that shaped uh, the nature of pandemic threat. However, the failure of the many of the Eastern European countries in the later phases of the pandemic were not addressed with similar puzzlement, but fell, like mostly the interpretation fell into uh, what Dacia Zenowska is looking at, how the Eastern, Eastern European countries are failing in the moral character of the, embodying the moral character of Europe proper. And then, of course, February 24th, 2022, Russia attacked Ukraine and started a war. And post-socialism, Eastern Europe, Cold War, and other markers of political history were dramatically resignified and actualized, or I mean, made up to date. Representation of socialism, Cold War, and Soviet Russian imperialism punctuate political conflicts of the moment and highlight the global impact of post-socialism. During the pandemic and in the ensuing crises, various meanings of socialism and to a lesser degree of post-socialism, they're called up as effectively charged switch points that have been utilized to set political horizons. As much as it speaks to the importance of post-socialism as an analytical framework, the war also proves that post-socialism needs to be in communication with other critical frameworks that undo imperial and colonial legacies, and that one without the other do not suffice to capture the global disruptions caused by post-socialist transformation. So this was my, I would say, preface to the talk that sort of situates what I will be talking about. And I will, mm -hmm. okay. Uh, there will be no more, post-socialist no more. I am uh, starting, uh, I am showing you a poster uh, from a civic organization called Decommunization and, um, so that is a reaction uh, at a at a political election of 2021 that they're deemed as truly historical. So it was in 2021 when the end of post-socialism era in the Czech Republic arguably finally arrived. Many cheered on yet again. The celebrations of the supposed e end of the era was prompted by the election debacle of the Communist Party of Czechia and Moravia that failed to achieve parliamentary representation for the first time in the whole modern history of Czechoslovakia and Czech and Slovak Republic. This was not only celebrated nationally, uh, but also uh, internationally. So for instance, uh, these are quotes uh, from uh, The Guardian that has celebrated uh, the election by saying, the result appeared to signal a highly symbolic, uh, 
sorry, there are technical issues, I cannot read it. Okay, highly symbolic final consignment to historical oblivion for the communists. Um, that was seen as the collapse of communism throughout Eastern Europe. So one election in Czech Republic clearly can do away with uh, post-socialism at large. Uh, also Czech public intellectuals join in. Jiří Hepeha is a very famous uh, political scientist claimed that it signals the end of the era of post-communism. The, the slogan itself, they will be no more, is actually uh, a pun. And it's a pun played on the most cliche image for state socialism. Some of you might remember that we were queuing for bananas, we were queuing for oranges or other scarce commodities, and we feared the call of the um, store, store clerks. They are no more. There is no more of the bananas or whatever you wanted. So the long cues and the irritating refrain, there is no more of consumerism bound by state socialist economy. The breakthrough that um, was seen as symbolic triumph for liberal democracy. I find it interesting how this consumer satisfaction is played out as the sort of final victory for uh, the market economy and the, bounty, the land of the bountiful. But interestingly, the end of post-socialism has been predicated from the very early beginning of the era. Um, so, for instance, I am just giving you a couple examples from uh, the theoretical uh, studies that were looking at how that are sort of talking about how the category of post-socialism is likely to break apart and disappear. Catherine uh, Humphrey, Carolyn Humphrey has argued in 2001, as the generations brought up under state socialist regime disappear from the political scene. Uh, Jurczak and Boyer has uh, a little bit later claimed that post-socialist studies in Eastern Europe have a vanishing object looking at post-socialism. So, I am actually, uh, I want to stay and dwell on that anxiety and this impatience to be over with post-socialism and get rid of that um, category. And contrarily, my book argues that post-socialism is a helpful uh, analytical category, that the pandemic unfortunately has proved how important that is. But also there is something interesting in this uh, cannot wait to be over cannot wait to return to something that perhaps is more normal or more pertinent or more important of a political topic. And I actually, in some sense, it, I would argue, expresses the rehabilitative uh, impetus or the, the curative impetus that I trace out throughout the several decades of uh, the historical development in the Czech Republic. So like just hold that in your mind, perhaps you can come back to it. Why are we so eager to get over? Now I finally, I that was a long oh, <laughs> overlude. I'm coming to the pandemic and impossibility of the crip horizons. And in a moment, I will become dutifully feminist crip killjoy. But I do want us to have some uh, glimpses of positive affectivity uh, to start with. So let me acknowledge what I would call or consider, if not crib horizon, at least glimpses of it, that were born out of the pandemic experience. I will quote, uh, the, the following two quotes come from interviews uh, that we did with colleagues in the spring and early summer of 2020. And they, to me, express something very important that could support and actually fortress, uh, buttress the crib horizons. So one quote, I don't think that the mask will protect me. It will protect others if I happen to be infected. I also find the symbolic meaning important. By wearing the mask, I'm signaling that I care, that there is something that we all share, that this in itself can move society towards something better. And another quote, I believe that in my, the mask, talking about masking here, I believe that mask might have some even small preventive effect. Because the preventive effect is possible, I do not mind wearing the mask. So here in these comments, I, I trace this belief that 
there is a shared responsibility, a shared uh, moment of care for each other. And that because there is at least a fractional possibility that I might help others, I will do whatever might not be pleasant, but I don't mind because I feel that I'm working towards something better, towards something shared and social. And um, this picture uh, that I am uh, showing you here is a small tree that is uh, placed at at a at a small town square in front of a historical building it is actually uh my hometown and it's a little tree that is instead of uh, fruit it bears masks and these masks were done by anonymous people that just had the means and time and capacity to produce masks and they they place it in the public space for others to take if they need it so Actually, it has become such a common occurrence that it created a special Czech word, a roškovník, a mask tree. And it happened uh, around the country on plentiful places that people just contributed because at the, and this was happening in the early months and weeks of the pandemic where there was a um, really sheer and we all remember there were no masks there were no protective um, equipment. So people sue, people started to sew and and also, apart from these mask trees, we had places where and there were uh, fences that were hung with bottles of disinfectants that, for people to take. And there was this shared understanding that I will only take what I need. I will not take more than I need. And then if I can, I will contribute to so, so other uh, other public location of assembly and, and taking. So all... All this to me speaks of the experience of the pan pandemic as a moment of disorientation, of a momentous rupture through the special temporal regimes of compulsory able-bodiedness and able-mindedness, and the disruption that as uh, and through rupture through the established he and hegemonic imaginaries and epistemologies. Um, you might remember that in the English-speaking world, world there has been a quote traveling around. Uh, as very effectively potent quote, I am in your lungs, you are in mine. In the Czech context, um, actually state adopted a version of it that has come from below. And that says, I protect you, you protect me. So in that articulation, you again feel the sort of notion of shared vulnerability and shared immunity. We need all to work codependently to create uh, immunity and immunity uh, response. Okay, let me skip here forward. So the motivational motto of the pandemic, together we will make it, together we will come through, might have been modeled and attempted to harness the powerful effect of solidarity and togetherness that marked the first weeks and months of the pandemic. The solidarity was indeed an exception and, and was unprecedented, and it led the media to draw connection and comparison to the giddy effects of the post-November um, 1989, so the sort of revolution moments. In the moments of dire need of um, protective gear, when the state could not fulfill its responsibility to protect its citizens, people shared and shared homemade disinfectants and improvised uh, DIY masks. It actually, uh, this sort of shared sharedness of vulnerability uh, even managed to break through uh, the gender stereotypes and also the, the compulsory whiteness of the nation, uh, the imagination of the nation. So one picture that you see here is taken uh, by me on a Mansusla Square central location in Prague. And it has a poster of a man wearing a mask, sitting down at a, at a table with a sewing machine and sewing a mask himself. So Matt, also men wear sewing mask and uh, the poster has a heading, you are our heroes, thank you. The other picture that is shown in the, in, in the image is a group of e, uh, South Asian e, uh, women, um, probably Vietnamese community, all of them are masked and are de they are delivering a, a bag full of protective gear to a collecting site. Um, so underlying the affective urgency of all-encompassing national belonging, the media highlighted that ethnic minorities participated in the protecting of the nation. Roma families, not pictured here, but they were pictured in the public discourse. Roma families, even Roma men, 
and community communities are portrayed to sew masks for hospitals and the first line workers, seniors and people living in institutions. The Czech East Asian community is very represented as organizing deliveries of masks and other protective gear through their business channels. And the media also took notice of how Vietnamese shops, they're offering free drinks and snacks to essential workers. Thus, the mask sewing a protection creation against the virus created a platform for construing narratives about the United Nation and more importantly about national belonging that stretched temporarily and momentarily beyond and across the usual narrow boundaries of, of respectable whiteness. Um, to cut across two years later or across several months, uh, you know that Czech Republic did not fare well in the pandemic. Many people died, uh, over 40,000 people died in the pandemic um, altogether. It is the highest count of death after the first, uh, the Second World War that is linked to one agent, one pathogen. So really COVID has uh, created an unprecedented number of deaths that were not necessary. Um, the pictures that I'm showing you, uh, the one on your the, the lower part of the screen is taken in Prague from Prague. And um, why I'm showing you the pictures to also document again a, a shared affect of loss and how actually there was a discordance with the state, these acts of remembering, this public mourning as Judith Butler calls it has been uh, initiated by uh, civic society in response to the state not taking care enough, not not being so ineffectual. So one one picture is taken in Prague. One is actually showing how this moment, the 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 act of remembering and mourning as a political act, traveled around the outside of Prague into regional centers. So in Prague, um, the first year. A civic initiative drew over 20,000 white crosses that marked the number of deaths at the moment. And then spontaneously people gathered, uh, wrote names of beloved ones that they had lost uh, to COVID. People gathered there and remembered. And also this, the act of mourning and remembering was a political and it was calling the state to a uh, responsibility. I find uh, this affect both of the hopeness or the sort of solidarity and this moment of mourning as an important affect that actually speak to this understanding of shared immunity, shared solidarity, and also potentially a new ways of relating to being vulnerable, to be being bared to the virus and becoming debilitated or disabled through the virus. So I am not claiming it as a, a romantic, a romanticized no, notion of grip horizon, but I think there is a moment of reaching and gesturing and perhaps glimpsing what that could be. And now I will become the killjoy. And now I will talk, I will try to identify several moments of why it did not happen or why why this shared notion of immunity did not survive longer than um, several months. Now I will talk about three specific moments that I list under the debts of post-socialism. Um, uh, the first one, I just realized I spilled my tea, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> A little crisis here, but I want to first talk about the uh, the, the binary and the sort of clash between uh, understanding a crisis as acute and as chronic. I will then talk about the emergence of the category of the vulnerable, and uh, I then want to talk about a specific, I play with the term triangulation here, immunological tri triangulation, so how the vulnerable was posited against the healthy child. Uh, naturally healthy and then against the COVID children and how this triangulation of the vulnerable with a uh, healthy child and a uh, COVID children um, uh, translated into notions of social injustice specific to the pandemic. Okay, so being a killjoy. I want to talk about the acute and versus the chronic uh, and to make you understand how the pre-existing neglect had actually come up through the pandemic. I turn to instances that illustrate how the acute need, needs of the pandemic effectively multiplied the already existing and often naturalized forms of neglect. It then, uh, okay. So the majority of society might have, might have ached to return to the normal 
But disabled people hoped that the pandemic experience would perhaps transform into solidaristic push for social change. Uh, and that I, I linked to pers um, multiple personal communication. This did not happen. Uh, and it is clear from the current attempts of the disabled activists with the support of disability NGOs happening actually yesterday and today to campaign for the increase of the state benefits to cover personal assistance in the extent that would allow disabled people to lead independent life. Contrarily to these expectations of optimism, the post-pandemic economic crisis is more likely to multiply the austerity logic that turns the private and familiar solution, turns to private and familiar solutions of structural and institutional barriers. Many of the recommended and, and or required practices of prevention resonate, resonated ambivalently with disabled people and Crips. Suddenly the carefulness and labor and the ex expertise developed for and through navigating the barriers and aggression of disablism and the strategies for surviving in toxic, contaminated and otherwise dangerous environment were called up as an expert knowledge useful to all. This was not always easy for disabled people to navigate as my friend uh, noted that his former OCD habits of cautious and ritualized hand washing and cleanliness that he had to unlearn to present a sane they're suddenly presented not only as health sustaining, but also morally binding under the pandemic regime. And as he noted for him though, the same, the same practices posited a difficult terrain to maneuver. It could have led back to his neuroatypicality and eccentricity that could not be outside of the acute viral crisis embraced by the Stennis collectivities. Disability, has also proven as a structural pre-existing condition influencing, if not outright, determining one's susceptibility to, to infection. Similarly to the trend elsewhere, the institutional housing or care facilities had to turn into the space with the highest death rates. And that would be important here to go into more depth. I don't have time for it. So I just uh, am picking out something that I find important, most important, uh, I'm leaning against work of my colleagues, um, Michal Sinek and Dana Hradcová, who have been doing ethnographic research in institution in the pandemic time. And they noticed that the clients of residential services, I quote, were subject to stricter and longer lockdown measures than the rest of the population, unquote. Furthermore, they all argue that the regulatory mechanisms that were introduced during the pandemic as a prevented strategy were not new mechanisms, but only, I quote, an intensification of technologies already and sort of disciplinary and restrictive technologies already in place. Similar multiplication of inaccessibility of assistance and other services affected disabled people living outside of total institutions. The social distancing protocol disabled many forms of already precarious informal assistance disabled people otherwise realize, rely on. So in short, this undifferentiated and universalized approach to health protection and to imagining shared immunity led not only to worsening of barriers and multiply disability exclusion, aggravated economic and social effects of disability oppression, but in some cases meant a direct threat uh, to survival of disabled people, as well as their family members who provide care. So therefore, a study that was carried out by the Alliance of, for Individual Support, an NGO active in support for um, individual individual support, maps the effects of the pandemic and pandemic governance on the disabled people and their social circles during the so-called first and second waves of the viral spread. So March through May 2020 in the Czech context. It concludes very much aligned with what I argue throughout the book, that the binary opposition dividing the acute from chronic health issues is not only misleading, but in effect and dangerous lives of the disabled people. So in their closing recommendation based on that, they argue that it's necessary to immediately review the procedures to protect health and lives in institutions of health and social care. The obvious and imminent risks such as COVID-19 cannot be considered as the only threats to health and life. But we also need to identify the risk that might lead to serious health threats, reduce quality of life, or even cause death when undetected. 
and uh, the sort of heavy conclusion is that the expanded definition of health and life risk cannot allow a polarized distinction of vital and other needs as it transpires, transpires that other needs might be as vital and failure to fulfill them as dangerous for the health and life of the client and disabled people. So the, the binary juxtaposition of two temporal regimes, the acute, that was supposedly articulated to govern the epidemic threat of viral exposure, and the chronic that both pre-existed and outlasted the temporal break of the acute, has been crucial for articulation of another distinction, their shared vulnerability of the collective on the one hand and the individualized identity of the vulnerable on the other. So basically to reframe, I'm arguing that the focus on the acute versus the chronic has also helped to uh, uh, bear and uh, emerge of the category of the vulnerable. So I will now uh, map the affect move from shell vulnerability to the vulnerable. And um, to give you a motto that I think encapsulates what I will be trying to unpack in more words, but I think it's here when you look. So the original motto that I started with, I protect you, you protect me. Ja chráním tebe, ty chráníš mě, was in a couple months uh, redrafted by the state initiative as I protect myself, I protect you. Chráním sebe, chráním tebe. So originally described by international, so just take in the sort of subtle but really important shift in the affect and uh, affective orientation. Originally described by international platform of expert, arguably in an appeal for more effective pandemic governance and protection, the concept of specific vulnerable groups came in the fore in the autumn of 2020 as the Czech state failed to manage another of the COVID-19 research. The Czech advocates of releasing strict measures lean against, for instance, the Great Barrington Declaration. So also what, I, what I'm trying to say here is that the it was not exceptional for the Czech context that it was happening elsewhere, but it had very specific um, echoes and implication for the Czech context. So Great Barrington Declaration was an uh, international manifest and uh, argued for introduction of the targeted rather than blanket pandemic protection procedures, which should arguably protect the immunologic and frag fragile, yet not curtail the everyday lives of those endowed with more robust health and immunity. So explicitly formulated in terms of an individualized and biologized ascription, the concept of the vulnerable represents a frame of the imagined immunity as collective, as shared, as a solidaristic, and, there, and instead of that, it focused on the individualized pandemic risk and costs. And I said this dynamic is apparent in the, in the reformulation of the pandemic responsibility as I protect myself, I protect you. That could be read as the, the care for you was resignified as not I will not burden you, I will take care of myself and therefore also protect you, but I will not rely on you, but I'm taking care of you. So I also will not burden you with the with protection of myself. Both immunity and responsibility remain a strong collective dimension still. However, once part in fulfilling this assignment of immunological or biological citizenship, changes and shifts its focus from the interdependence and connection to others onto one's responsibility for oneself and my own or one's own dependence. And I believe that the motto, I protect myself, therefore I protect you, it thus becomes the sort of illustrative, pandemic illustration of the rehabilitative citizenship of the sort of responsibility attached uh, to uh, that rehabilitative citizenship. Okay, here we hear the animal commentary. The notion of the vulnerable is an expression of affective distancing and distancing mechanism. Instead of acknowledgement of vulnerability as a condition of more than human so sociality, the birth of the vulnerable reifies vulnerability as a particular and not particular valued identity. The category of the vulnerable de this socializes the pandemic risks and cost 
instead of understanding a once vulnerable as socially situated condition, the vulnerable becomes a remedicalized, stable determinant determinant of infection risk that can be easily projected from the physical characteristics of the individual. In short, as I eliminate in the following section, the vulnerable reaffirms the violence of value attributed to human lives in the ableist regime. And I will now come to think through how the figure of the vulnerable enabled articulations of a new concept of pandemic ethics founded in and legitimized through the logic of unjust redistribution of viral risks and pandemic costs. Okay, here we come to the deaths of post-socialism. The critiques of the pandemic governance utilize narratives of the transformation or the post-socialist transition and mark the COVID-19 crisis as a historical marker of the post-socialist phase. I, these are all quotes from public media. The COVID-19 was coined as the worst phase of the developments in 1989, the new onset of uh, totalitarianism, or uh, define it as we find ourselves on the brink of a fatal social change. Some other people talk about the communist totalitarianism being simply replaced by COVID totalitarianism. So, and I could give you, I have here a longer list of uh, examples that I will just skip. I also, if you have time, I have a funny clip, but uh, for interest of time, I'm skipping it for now. We can come back to it later. And I want to show you, okay, this is what we might come back to. Um, what I'm showing you here is a visuals of the so-called, the, the name of the institution of the platform is the Healthy Forum, Zdrave Forum, one of the very vocal platforms that critique the state's efforts to limit the viral spread through masking and inoculation, ex and the set of visuals expli explicitly evokes the visuals of the Civic Forum, Občanské Forum, a, no a non-partisan political platform leading the 1989 protest and post uh, and the sort of revolutionary efforts. So the the bigger screen, uh, shot of the website is the Healthy, healthy Forum. The, the smaller uh, images on your right hand, the OF is the re a visual representation of the civic platform uh, that led the revolutionary efforts. You see that both of the visuals use the white, uh, blue and red uh, tricolora colors of the Czech flag. And, uh, and also the sort of acronyms OF and ZF, uh, the, the Healthy Forum, Zdrave Forum, uh, the Civic Forum. So you see how also in the word, as well as the visuals, as well as the acronyms, they are consciously calling up the memory of the Civic Platform that was uh, associated with the fight for freedom and the fight against the state oppression, state socialist oppression. And again, the scare of the new onset of socialism or the new onset of totalitarianism has traveled globally. Uh, most markedly, we could look to the US. However, I want to argue that here, because of the link to the meta narratives of post socialist transition and, in, and the sort of uh, history of socialist totalitarianism in the Czech Republic, it helped to reframe the pandemic experience from an issue of a biosocial into a political threat and a biosocial and and the biosocial into political vulnerability. And I think this is really important in, and also had effects on the death counts. As I trace how the pandemic translates the political into the biological and then the political and then the biological back into the political, the concept of the vulnerable is locked to its conceptual twin, natural immunity. And I think I will need to be speeding up here. Uh, if, if I'm too quick, uh, I will be very happy to take a moment in the Q&A and explain to more detail. So natural immunity and the uh, and spe specifically children who were a child who was seen as being imbued with natural immunity was a figuration that stood in a contrast as a binary other to the vulnerable. So but by offering the choreography of triangulation, where also the COVID children come up, 
I am uh, trying to map the ways in which this triangulation allowed to foster not only the ableist regime of viral free reign, but also larger claims about social inequality and justice. So the concept of natural immunity argues that one is or should be endowed with an inherent capacity to withstand the contact with the virus unless you are vulnerable and already your immunity is compromised. Not only that you should withstand the contact with the virus and child being still young and healthy is the sort of uh, ideal embodiment of that, but actually because you come into the touch with the virus, your immunity is boosted. So it's actually good for you to be uh, encountering the virus. So it gives you something. It's uh, giving you some advantage unless you're vulnerable. So it becomes the juxtaposition of the future. Excuse me, let me start again. So the concept of the natural immunity argues that one is or should be endowed with an inherent capacity to withstand the contact with the virus. And it becomes the juxtaposition of the future because um, the, represented by the natural healthy immune children and the past and stunted development represented by the vulnerable, the old, disabled and crib. Contrarily, the state imposed overprotection can pervert the future and lead to the future generations that I, I quote, that will be obese, sick, will not internalize good life habits and can drastically burden the Czech healthcare system, unquote, in the future. So by overprotecting and by, by advantaging the vulnerable, you are taking the opportunity away from the healthy to uh, get their immunity boosted. But even more, because there is the state overbearance and overprotection, you are actually making them into disabled, into sick, unreliable, into obese. So the COVID children, interestingly, only imagine as a plural, never individual identity. The COVID children are the sort of disability metaphor coming out of the the new disability metaphor coming out of the pandemic. So the Healthy Forum construes a triangle, triangle figuration of children, the idealized representation of the robust natural immunity, the vulnerable who need to be protected from the viral threat, and the COVID children, children whose immunity was compromised either through immunization, also uh, vaccination here is seen as something that hurts the children. Again, very usual disability discourse. Um, or through overprotection. So the COVID children are pictured as the casualty of the protective measures. And what is interesting here that this pandemic disability triangulation offers a new and competing uh, vision of moral economy of immunity. The moral message communicated through the juxtaposition of the children whose arguable naturally robust immunity uh, is fried through the overprotection is linked to the notion of unjust redistribution of risk. And I um, am coming too close so to keep the time. So I will end with these two quotes. Uh, one is coming to the address to the parliament from November 2020, where people argued that vaccination redistributes the suffering of those who would fall ill if they were not vaccinated onto those who will suffer because of vaccination. And uh, similarly, the Healthy Forum argued that it is, it is not possible to protect small percentage of all population in such a way that destroys the lives of all others. Um, I wanted to uh, finish on that, um, uh, looking at this uh, unjust, the, the notion of the unjust redistribution of pandemic risks and costs, because it actually continues and, and maps onto the present discussion about austerity. And I think this is really important of how pandemic helped to uh, redraft the sort of moral economies of who is responsible for whom or how we relate to each other, but also what is socially just and what is morally legitimate, therefore. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Katarzyna. It was so rich uh, and, and really amazing talk. 
And um, I wonder if we would like to start discussion or we should uh, watch the film you have announced. I oh. think we have mm -hmm. If so you see, I was conscious of the time you, uh, I don't know, do we have time for it? I think we do. Okay, so give me a moment to uh, pull it up. Uh, could you pull up yep. the... So what I'm showing you is coming from, um, it will be, a, a give, let, let's give you the context first. So it will be a clip uh, presented by one of the um, presidential candidates. We're not sharing yet. Oh, we are not sharing no. it yet? Okay, sorry. That um, has uh, stood up for election as a, as a, for a presidential run uh, later that year. It's called the the fighter 21 and the presidential candidates uh, position himself here as a protector and as somebody that has to parachute down into the land uh, to save the people that are being governed by this impersonal voice that uh, here we see his heroic run. And um, the voice over reads, for your own good, we order you to follow the directions. We order you in the name of the people's will. You must not sing, you must not play. The children must not laugh. We give you precise orders and demand that you follow them. We punish strictly any transgressions. You need to report anyone who does not follow these rules. It is in the name of well-being of all of us for, your, for our own good, for safety of, of your security. So the voiceover clearly is parodied as this uh, state protection that is imposing all this um, pandemic regulation. And uh, here we have the fighter that parachutes down and throws a hammer into, into the screen and therefore kills the voiceover and, and uh, frees everybody. The paradox is that actually he ripped that off. The, the, whole, um, the whole short film promo is actually uh, taken out of the Macintosh promotion. Of, it's, it's a whole uh, Orwell uh, play, but it's taken from an advert for personal uh, computers done by Macintosh in uh, 1984. So there is another paradox how he is using uh, this material for a metaphor of freeing us from the overbearing state uh, that was actually a material that is sort of linking us and we can we can continue from uh, linking it the paradox uh, uh, we can unpack and elaborate the paradox through the work of Shoshana Zuboff who links the um, the personalized technologies and personalized content to what she calls the surveillance capitalism so I think the paradox does not mm -hmm. end here um, sorry I'm not playing the whole film but I was worried that it uh, would be fussy and I would not get it in time you would like to go back and stop sharing <laughs> yeah I, I think I can do it okay <laughs> sorry there are too, too many people handling the computer <laughs> you're still sharing why not? Why not? Okay. So, uh, should we watch it, or do we just stay with you? I would. I would just stay and use okay. the time for because okay. we are at the hour. So, uh, I would thank you, okay. thank you, Magda, for okay. giving. Thank you. Um, but still, with your description, I can imagine it perfectly. So, <laughs> thank you. So, um, I think we should open. We could open uh, Q and A. So, if there are any comments or questions, uh, please just um, raise your hand or write a comment uh, in a chat or turn on your camera and and ask it. Okay. While waiting for, for questions, uh, maybe I, I, I will start mm, or, um, well, my question is, uh, you said about those um, division, about this division into East and West that became like so vivid again 
uh, in this uh, critical pandemic situation. And um, on one hand, uh, but on the other hand, uh, this relation to, or this metaphor of totalitarian regime that was enabled by this critical situation appeared both in this post-socialist and in, uh, in the Western societies. So I wonder what impact had the like historical social uh, memory and experience of actually living in a totalitarian regime um, in this context that this metaphor was so powerful on both, I would say both sides of Iron Curtain, if that's the, the right way to put it. We cannot hear you. Thank you. I think it's a complicated question uh, in some sense, in some sense, very simple and on some sense more complicated. I would I would want to start by uh, perhaps leaning on the work of others who have argued that both socialism and post-socialism have actually had a global relevance and global reach, even though it was happening even though the state uh, socialism regime were happening sort of ge you know, ge geographically uh, bounded locations. And that was also that that played out in the rhetoric of Cold War that have actually shaped societies globally, both in the East and in the West. So in that sense, it, it's not surprising that uh, the discourse of the state overreach and the danger of that has still global reach and is playing out not only in the states or in the location that we can claim a specific historical memory because the historical memory is again much broader than that. Uh, that said, uh, I do believe that it had different intensity and different reach and had had different impacts on how um, the preventive measures have been interpreted and I I am blaming these discourses of uh, the danger of state uh, overreach and totalitarianism as, in fact, uh, another very powerful affective location or construction that had made crip horizons impossible, something that disabled uh, and made impossible uh, affects of collectivity and solidaristic notions. So it is not an uh, it is not an um, coincidence that the Healthy Forum has been one of the platform mo most visible and perhaps most uh, most active forum that had brought in and stood behind the individualist notions of responsibility and protection and also respond the individualist um, notions of um, of immunity. Something that I did not uh, show, uh, but work with in the whole text of the conclusion is that actually, strangely, perhaps not strangely, many in many ways, the discourse of the pandemic and post-pandemic uh, resembles and echoes the discourse of the 90s. So not only in the sense we are back to tightening our belts and needing to catch up with the healthy social normal, but also uh, the metaphors that were applied to the virus and immunity are mapping onto a metaphors of uh, economic rationality. So for instance, uh, in the 90s, the, the free market has been celebrated and legitimized as something that is natural, organic, is not socially engineered, is not intervened into, and therefore is something that can secure the natural and organic development into uh, of the society into just by chance, because there is no other way into the capitalist democracy. And in similar ways, the, the, the affective uh, attachment to natural immunity has been also coded as something that is not socially engineered, that is happening organically, et cetera. So um, therefore it could also translate into the notion of uh, what is justifiable, what is just, what is morally uh, justifiable in terms of redistribution and um, um, restructuring. I hope that it responds to the question. 
Yeah, yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, other um, any other comments or questions? Because I have many more, so. <laughs> I would also just want to voice again that I am really grateful that you are here Friday afternoon, sunny outside. <laughs> uh, I really value that, even if the questions are not immediate, immediate or imminent. Okay, so maybe I will go with uh, with another one. When we were talking about um, a pandemic as this moment of, of disorientation that was very quickly that there was very quickly some scenario put on this with all these anti-vaccine movements and these metaphors of, of uh, totalitarian regime and so on so before that we uh, you, you said that we have uh, we had this disorientation time um, and what really, uh, like some other metaphor that comes to my mind is like this Bakhtin carnival time where people are outside their social roles somehow. And it is, I think, very much connected with labor and with work uh, mm -hmm. somehow, because um, something that stro struck me is that you saw, you um, show uh, this man uh, doing this female work of uh, like mm -hmm. taking care and, and sewing these masks. Then we had this um, ethnic minorities that I suppose in Czech Republic, there is this very similar discourse toward uh, immig immigrant workers that they are taking something away from the, the right citizens, yeah? Uh, and here we have this uh, um, these people like giving something and caring. The same with uh, people with disabilities that uh, somehow turn uh, into experts on how to manage uh, online work or um, like taking care of uh, yourself and the other uh, people. So um, there's this time of transgression that is like this. There is this very carnival time. Um, uh, vibe in this I, I think this it this is this is a this is an interesting provocation mm -hmm. I think from top of my head not giving it more like not having time to rethink it properly but I think the diff one of the difference that I see here that carnival is socially sanctioned it is everybody knows it is only a limited temporality everybody knows how short it will go and it is a the Bakhtinian carnival is the upturn that actually reifies the, the norm through subverting it for a short term. I think what was different here is that that was this sort of open-endedness that uh, the disorientation that uh, was not expected, that was not linked to any concrete time that had a social calendar and that was open-ended. So, uh, and I think in some sense, we could carry it over. There are moments of some, there are, and uh, Dakamar, who is also in the audience, uh, we, we have been in the morning, the, the ESTA conference is happening right now in, uh, in Prague. So a lot of Polish disability community, were in, some of them were in the room in the morning and presumably are still in Prague. But we have also talked about how, um, how that experience of pandemic actually did uh, create something that in a good and bad uh, ways, and that's something that we could carry over, that there, it's not this bracketed time where the disruption is allowed and sanctioned by uh, the norm and the sort of embodiment of that norm and disciplining or um, institutions. But uh, so this is a first response to that provocation. Um, but I think Dan Goodley, who was also here in Prague, has sort of asked us, the disability panel, at the end of talking about the pandemic, what did we lose? What can we retrace from the pandemic? Uh, and quoting or gesturing to what Dagmar brought is that uh, her disabled students actually are carrying this affect of, oh, we finally recognize and understand how disposable and how unimportant are because after this first 
look to us or something that might have created a gesture of, oh, you belong and we will care for you uh, has very quickly been translated into, oh, we now understand that nobody will look to us. One of the, so also what I wanted to stress is then why I don't uh, authoritatively want to talk about Crip Horizon as something that happened, but rather glimpses or gestures or sort of intuitions of what could be through the pandemic was that um, the understanding of vulnerability and even shared, shared immunity and vulnerability did not have the intersectional understanding and sensitivity. So it was very quickly universalized. Uh, I take I take care of you, you take care of me actually did not have the sensitivity to make space for our needs and protective needs might differ. And I might need you to do something different than I do for you. So that we, we would need to push more for, and we would need to uh, re-articulate that shared immunity and what it, and I go into more details in the text of why it did, it wasn't, it was a lot, but it was not necessarily enough or we would have to uh, push further. So part of why it, part of the fail was already written into the understanding of that shared immunity. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. If not, uh, okay. Um, there is a question, I think, from Agnieszka in the chat. Thank you for such a rich presentation. I really appreciate your analysis. I'm still thinking about the acute chronic dynamics that you analyzed. I wonder if you have any thoughts also on using the underlying conditions in the public discourse in, and how it relates to disability. This is, thank you so much. That is actually a really good pointer to something that I should engage with more and bring it into. Um, don't have any more complex thought on that other than I think what you have been thinking through giving me the question is that it also sort of suggests that um, we could have not done anything better and that this sort of pandemic has revealed what has been sort of covered and is also it to sort of support and, and give more credit or more weight to your argument is also uh, very quickly talking about the COVID children and the cost of the protection. Uh, this is exactly what was coming out. And uh, there was one public uh, commentator who wrote that, you know, COVID death is a just death. It takes those who are vulnerable. It does not kill healthy people, but takes exactly, it reveals the underlying conditions and sort of lays the death only there where it would come sooner or later anyway. So uh, yeah, thank you so much. I think underlying conditions is exactly this sort of expression of chronicity. Um, the Chronicity also played in the, the sort of interplay of acute and the chronic has, has also played out in the Roma communities around the Czech Republic that have been, apart from this heroization and the sort of inclusion in the in, in this more than white nation had also been very ambivalent. So in the public discourse, uh, Roma people have been heralded and, and celebrated and thanked for the inclusion in the sort of uh, national effort to see mask. At the same time, in many of the sort of zones of abandonment or chronic abandonment, if you will, um, the zones of social segregation, people were asking, so what is COVID? Like, do you believe in COVID? Because of course, uh, the acute did not map onto their chronic map. Like uh, the sort of life in this chronic on, uh, context and conditions of abandonment did not really matter. Not to speak of the distrust of the medical authorities and institutions. It just, and also impossibility of actually adhering to any of the preventive measures. How can you speak about sheltering in home in places that don't have windows, that don't have electricity or running water, where um, you don't get any social benefits, even though you would reach, like you cannot access that uh, state support. 
so the the COVID did not matter till long. Uh, and importantly also, we actually don't know how Roma communities in the Czech Republic lived through the COVID crisis because when I did my, and I read it, repeat like periodically, uh, look through reflections and both media and social science uh, research, there is none. There is one person that has been writing about um, and has who has actually noticed this sort of the acute uh, COVID crisis doesn't really touch us because first we have already so much chronic abandonment and issues that we need to deal with. And then also, even if it touches us, we don't have means to protect ourselves from it. So this chronic abandonment also translated into a lack of any interest for people that are living in the sort of chronic zones of uh, disposability and neglect. On the other hand, again, talking about East Europe, Czech Republic sort of uh, did have a lot of, or relatively comparatively, had several articles covering the COVID crisis in the Roma villages in the Eastern Slovakia to sort of, again, construe itself as not East and East is elsewhere. Um, they have talked about the sort of chronic abandonment and misery of Roma communities in uh, the sort of villages. And everybody here in the Czech Republic understands what these Roma villages mean. And they're actually not villages, but the sort of place of dumping of Roma people. But I, again, like this is why I think the East and West uh, has really become again, uh, so important and reconfigured throughout the, uh, both the COVID and then uh, the war crises. Thank you for this uh, for this uh, answer. Uh, I think it really it's a really important issue uh, to to put race and class uh, on the table when talking about um, about COVID, uh, not only disability and not not only those macro scale um divisions into east west i mean this is why um sorry to jump in unless there is a question uh this is why i wanted to start with talking about the east and west and labor mm -hmm. and the disposable labor because uh in the czech context um a lot of the decision about whose bodies need to be protected and how has been done on against or in juxtaposition on the background of thinking about uh, Czech economy as the sort of based on the cheap labor. So factories have not been closed down. Again, of course, that means that more people got sick, perhaps might have a long COVID after that. So the class, labor, ethnicity, and disability cannot really be separated through the pandemic um, play out. Thank you. Uh, I think we are perfectly on time. <laughs> so uh, thank you so much, uh, Katarzyna, thank for you. your talk and uh, for um, answering all the all the questions and for the discussion. So now let's have uh, something like 10 minutes break and let's meet for a second part of our meeting uh, when Katarzyna and Alison uh, will, uh, will uh, host a, a workshop. Um, 